first of all, just congratulations on this Oscar nomination. It's incredible. I wanted to ask, where were you when you first found out you were nominated? What were your reactions, your emotions? What was the first thing you did? So I was in where Max is right now. And then I just started cursing. <laughs> that's what I do. My phone was calling and I just picked up and some it was some like someone was having like a feverish dream or something. It was just like kind of gibberish saying stuff and he was like come over here come over here and i didn't know where he meant so i i went from the other end of the studio out in the hallway and it sounded like the building was on fire but it was it was only Saban sort of screaming that it actually like it actually happened it's like call your family yeah. <laughs> remember this <laughs> yeah, yeah i said remember this <laughs> <laughs> remember, remember this really this. aggressively. I said it very aggressively. Yeah. You talented. Remember this. You're about to die. <laughs> uh, Ricard, where were you? Uh, I was actually at home. Uh, I set an alarm and was up at five in the morning and uh, listened to the announcement and remember it like one after one. And I'm like, oh my God. And then Nick, who was announcing, he paused and then he said, who's a week? And I just like started screaming, obviously. Woke up my girlfriend. I'm like, it's happening. <laughs> and I texted these guys like, guys, I think we got it. Because <laughs> even at that point, you're not sure because it's so surreal. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, I'm like, I don't trust my eyes like right now. Like that Nick Jonas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't trust. <laughs> that prankster. <laughs> no, he's great. <laughs> no, it's still surreal. Even hearing it now and talking about it, it, it just nah, never gets old. So starting from like the very beginning, I, I, I'm curious, I think as a kid, when you think about like being a musician as a dream job, you think about being a rock star, a pop star, you don't necessarily jump to songwriter, producer. When did the three of you first become aware of that, like being a job and something that you were attracted to doing? I mean, I was in a boy band in high school and I sent out a demo tape of to just random a random address that happened to be Jive Records. And I get a call from this guy named Dave McPherson and, and it was like 7.30 in the morning when I woke up from school. Or when I woke up, it's getting ready for school. And he's like, is Sovin Kataka there? Said, yeah, it's not the kitchen. And he says, you know, so I somehow got this demo tape on my desk. It sounds like shit, but my, my assistant put it on my desk and I listened to it. And they used to just make demos by pushing record. You know, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just pushing record and I didn't, I was too lazy to learn other people's songs. So I would just write. And he goes, I just signed this band called the Backstreet Boys and I want them to record this song. Wow. You know? And I said, well, you know, I have a boy band and I was hoping that you know, <laughs> we would be performing this song like at two school, like a school talent show thing. And you know, I was going to try and I want to try and get a record deal because I didn't know Jive Records was like a big label. And he was like, listen, kid, I could tell by your name that you're not white. And I said, yeah, I'm Indian. And he goes, you know, I'm a black American, so I'm not saying this in a racist way. But he goes, no girl in Wisconsin is going to put an Indian guy on her wall. You should be a songwriter. Your story. Wow. That's fantastic. What was the name of your boy band? Forte. There's actually a the movie based on loosely based on that story is actually in development at Universal Pictures. <laughs> oh, so sick! Yeah, are you gonna be Mark. in it? You're gonna star in the movie? No, I'm producing it. <laughs> Me and Mark Platt, and then Universal right now. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah, uh, Ricardo, how about you? Um, I think for me, I started out as a musician at a young age, playing instruments, and I don't think songwriting was never actually a part of the plan for me. It just kind of how everything ended up happening in my life. I got to know some great people and some of the best songwriters in the world, uh, Max Martin and Savan Kotesha, who's actually right here. Um, and for some reason, it just came naturally in, in my career to start exploring new parts of music that I haven't done before or hadn't done before at that point. And it was just, um, it was so interesting coming from more of, of the live aspect or the, the musicianship of it to be able to craft songs. And I was always so like, when the first, I remember the first time I heard that there was like this 
secret songwriting team behind all the big pop songs in the world. I was like, oh my God, that's like the coolest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> it's like, really? And so I was always like, and I mean, I could never dream of to one day be a part of that crew. Um, but it, I guess, once again, the universe, you manifest those things somehow. And now I'm in the best team ever with the best people. And I'm so happy. I was always a band guy. And I was in this hardcore, like hardcore metal band, uh, which was kind of almost starting to take off a little bit. Like people were talking about it in a really like in a big way, sort of. And we got some potentially huge gigs and like um, our, our, our singer just um, he, he he left to go on another endeavor and he went. So he left the band and moved north to Stockholm. And then he became the songwriter that's Shellback now, that made like, uh, hey, I can't stop the feeling, moves like Jagger and stuff like that. So then th that, was, that's, that was when I realized that that's something that you could actually do. Um, but I still went on to play in bands for, I mean, pretty many years. Uh, that that must have that's 15 years ago at least and i think i moved up here to stockholm 5 years ago with the intention that okay i um like i'm the the band thing is going like too slow and i just i want to move like it it was hard to get all the people together and stuff so i moved and i like started hammering away then um uh, nice yeah uh, let's talk about how the three of you got involved with the film Eurovision Song Contest. What was it like getting that call? Had any of you ever like worked on songs for Eurovision proper? How did you all get involved? Executive produced the music and for the whole movie, so I got a call from Netflix. My friend Amy Dunning asking me about Eurovision. She was just like, "Oh, there's this movie," and we were always for years. Me and Amy have been trying to find something to do together, and she knew I just started Charlie's Angels and. I was like, she was like, there's this movie I'm trying to find. It's like about Eurovision, Will Ferrell. You know, you're around a lot of Swedish people. Do you know anyone that would be interested in helping with this? And I was like, I'd do it. That sounds fun. <laughs> she sent me the script and she was like, you know, maybe you should try out one song and meet the director, David Dobkins, who I was already a huge fan of. Um, and I... I, I talked to him. I talked to the screenwriter. I read the script. I loved the script. The first draft that I read was so funny. And we t tried out one song, which was Double Trouble. I wrote one song. And then after that, they sort of got the gig. And the way I usually work when I'm EPing stuff is, you know, I'm around like these guys, some of the best talents in the world. So I just sort of gather the troops and say like, hey, you know, they, they were working together, them two. And, 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 said hey there's this thing and there's these songs that we need and is anyone interested in helping and then these guys luckily rose and when someone asks you if you want to write a song for will ferrell potentially you, you kind of get yeah you say yes <laughs> <laughs> sorry max yeah no no you're, that was you're the perfect. right answer <laughs> it was the right answer yeah <laughs> Well, it's interesting to get the call to write for Will Ferrell, I imagine, is different from getting the call to write for any other pop star. What did you find were some of the like most surprising differences or challenges in writing a song for what's basically a narrative musical versus kind of a self-contained pop song? Well, first I, of all, Will Ferrell's a lot more sexy. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I think, I think we went about it the way of... I remember talking to Sovan about that. Let's write it as like the characters in the movie are real uh, stars or like pop stars. Um, and also write the songs just as good as you would write or any other artist in the world. Yeah. Make this really like credible and like that the songs should be able to, to be real songs, basically yeah. is what I'm saying. Yeah. Even though with yeah. a funny concept, that would be easy to like, oh, is it all going to be just like, like funny things and someone was like no let's let's try to write this like as real songs real quote unquote i think you understand yeah. no i think you don't write down for it exactly know? exactly so you treat the characters like real art treat them with some integrity there's a lot in the script so treat them like 
you would if you were in a big artist session. Mm -hmm. You brought up the idea of like heartfeltness and sincerity. There's not a ton of comedy in the song Husavik. And I'm curious what it was like to find that balance between kind of comedy and sincerity. Were there earlier versions that had jokes in it? What, what was it like finding that balance? Looking at it, just coming straight out of outside the Eurovision, looking at it, it looks pretty like spectacular and like maybe it's wacky. Um, and so we, we knew that we had like comedy and we have that sort of like context, but we, we still wanted to, so, so we didn't have to like try hard to, to like make it funny. It was rather, yeah, finding the balance because it is like Sigrid who's singing the song is going through a real struggle and like we wanted that to to really shine through so we we tried to get in her head a lot while writing it does that involve like speaking with david about getting into his getting into her head does it involve researching like icelandic culture what 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 did it feel like to get into her head like that there were a lot of conversation with david for sure and and with andrew um and will actually i mean it was a you know Mostly David, um, just, yeah, it was, a lot of the answers were in the script and in the story, right, guys? I think that yeah. her journey, her journey yeah. of what she was looking for and, and trying to say to Lars is also something so relatable, you know, of, of you know, Absolutely. you're in love with someone who wants the whole world and you just want them and you go along for the ride for a minute, but you, you want to say, look, I don't care about all this. I just want you. You're trying to get approval from everyone. I just want you, you know. Yeah, we got a lot, a lot for free, so to speak, from the great script. I used astral projection to get in, actually get inside Sigrid's <laughs> head in, in the movie universe in the okay. future because the film wasn't made yet. But that's one so way to talk go about it. <laughs> like Max, I know he mentioned he'll tell you he got inspiration from his hometown. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. my wife was going through that. We just moved back to Sweden now. And and in not a lot of my friends would know, but we were already planning the move around then because for very similar reasons, we moved to LA. She's Swedish. That's why it's been random. We didn't just randomly move to Sweden. <laughs> like, um, but, you know, she was from Sweden and she moved with me to LA so I could chase my dreams. And after it blew up and got, in, you know, crazy, she was just like, I don't want any of this. I just want you and our kids. I don't want, and I want to go back home. I don't want, I don't need to have all this, LA Hollywood stuff, you know? And I think so we're all I think, got to relate to it in certain ways. And I also think that that was something that a lot of people that, that watched the movie could relate to because during that time they needed to laugh and have a good time, but also like the, the emotional parts of the, of that song is really what Savan just said. I think a lot of people were, you know, they realized like the fundamentals of life is usually the things that are right in front of you and the, pe the people you love and, you know, uh, and I think everyone got to see this, like this year, it's been hard for a lot of people. Max, what about your hometown uh, specifically made it into the song? It was definitely like the, the starting point and everything was definitely a, like Sigrid's hometown. Um, and at, at, when we were just building the skeleton of the song, we didn't know exactly which hometown it was going to be. But I, like... I was sort of imagining um, her Icelandic hometown and at the same time trying to fetch like stuff from my hometown and what I think about going there. So like, again, astral projection going there. I started hearing like seagulls and seeing whales and uh, <laughs> yeah. water and mountains, nature, stuff like that. Yeah, beautiful. And and and, my, and so my hometown also has like seagulls, uh, that which annoy you really a lot. <laughs> uh, when, like, when you're there, you you just like pick the perfect breakfast plate at the hotel, and you go out in the sun, you're gonna <laughs> eat it. But you just have to get your coffee, and while you're doing that, like the seagulls, like when you get back out, they like they took everything, they mate in the middle of the night right outside your window when you try to sleep so like you they they get underneath your skin but then also like when you're traveling around you're doing all this stuff 
like when you get back into town and you hear the seagulls it's like the warmest feeling still like you you just love coming back to that as well i know for a lot of the tracks there was kind of a mixture of rachel mcadams and my mary ann's vocals what was that process like kind of overall during throughout the entire piece but also with this song specifically my Marianne is actually a Swedish artist named Molly Sandin, who, who, it was just sort of kismet that she, she, you know, we wrote this song, Double Trouble. She was in town and, and one of my co-writers of that song was like, I was like, we need a girl to sing it before we present it to David. And um, he was like, oh, I have a friend in town. She can come, you know, she's a great singer. And turns out she was Molly Sandin and who in Sweden is probably like the, one of the biggest pop stars. And, um, she killed it. And when everyone heard her voice, they were like, oh my God, she has to sing all of the songs. And weirdly, when we had a day in the studio with Rachel, um, who was so, so lovely and, and, and super shy to sing in, in get behind the booth. And I can understand that, you know, when you're hearing Molly's vocals, but strangely, she had the same like timber to her voice as Molly. So there are definitely like parts where you could just sort of blend like in the chorus and, the, you know, she's obviously not a singer singer like Molly is, but there, there are moments in all the songs that Rachel sings and you, I think you hear it or that Molly sings. And I think you hear it in the movie when she's, when it's like, she's writing my hometown on the um, piano. Yeah. That's all Rachel. Yeah. And, and you believe that that voice sings on stage as well. Cause it's weirdly, they have the same sort of that same tone and timber. Mm -hmm. so it was pretty easy to sort of like slip her in when you can you know that's awesome and what was uh, we talked about his objective sexiness what is will ferrell like as a vocalist in a studio what what did he bring that surprised you all he was so nice he was just so nice and collaborative you know yeah you know it was it was so easy to i mean not that i would think anything different i guess but he was so easy to just say, I mean, it's like you, don't, you don't hear a diva Will Ferrell stories. He's always known to be like the <laughs> exactly. nicest guy. Um, that would be great for, yeah, I'd love very, that for him though. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he was so collaborative. It was very much like me and David as well, like directing him in the booth, you know, and like, try this. And why don't we try it like this? And, you know, there was a point where we thought, we needed, there wasn't enough accent. And he was such a trooper and he came in, he took as many takes as possible. He was a perfectionist. Very collaborative and like welcome to like join ideas and yeah. ball back and forth. Yeah. And his wife is Swedish. So I think he felt home like at the studio because it's all, all Swedes. Didn't he like yeah. Rick did you say when he first came? Yeah, no, I was having he lunch. He came down and was like, Sha, like, hi, and Swedish started talking Swedish to everyone on the table, and everyone was like freaking out. It was so oh. funny. I was just sitting having lunch, and all of a sudden, Will walks in, like, at our studio here in LA, and he just, and he stands there, and it's that, like, moment of, like, do I say? He something? was standing behind me. He, yeah. I, I didn't know what was I, I didn't see him. I was just saying, we were just sitting having lunch, and, and I then saw all you of a guys sudden, his eyes just... going above my head. <laughs> yeah. And then he I says in Swedish, back. like, how are you guys doing? <laughs> we're all like, oh. I think the weekend was there. I think, like, other people were there, and they were all excited that Will Ferrell was going to yeah. be in. Yeah. Ari. Yeah, no, yeah. there's something about movie stars, for sure. That's it. I want to get a little in the music theory weeds with y'all, if you'll indulge me. Um, I love how the chorus is kind of founded on like a big suspension resolution, that four to the three. I think that's such like a curious thing to hang a chorus on. I'm curious, what is the emotion you think we get out of that suspension to resolution? Were there any other kind of like harmonic uh, foundations for a chorus you were noodling on? Where, where did that specific move come from? Is that when you feel it here in your stomach? <laughs> I mean, that's I what I feel. Yeah, that's what sure. I. Yeah, that's that's what I go by. I should write down what you said. If somebody ever <laughs> asks for it, the theoretic part, I think. I, I mean, I can only speak for myself. I always try to search for that, where, where the melody like sits in a way over the chords where you feel, uh, we feel something. That ba 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 ba. That part of it like really just hits me, and I'm curious where that came from. I think it just like drop it just like dropped in 
I think. All us pop writers disappoint people that know theory, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's just theory. a mess. Like, it's just like <laughs> No, it's scary, yeah. For me, for me, it's about going. I, I don't I don't use theory actually at all while writing. I'm just like listening ma- mainly. I'm listening like a few of my what I think is my like best songs so far is those idea ideas come like when I'm out walking in the nighttime or just like a lot of a lot of my ideas come they don't come in the studio in the room like I just bring music from the studio and I bring it out and I like I do it like when 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 I get transported when I'm on a bus or or a train or just like looking out a window while traveling and just like thinking about other stuff then it just like it just some a lot of stuff just comes to me and it feels like it's all it feels like it's already written and you have to sing it to everyone around you like is, is this taken no 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 or whatever yeah you know what i mean <laughs> yeah that's the thing every time you come up with something you think is really good you're paranoid that it's something else yeah yeah oh yeah everyone asks everybody is this something does it sound familiar does it because you don't you know those yeah. learned lines lawsuit got everyone freaked out <laughs> hard precedent to set yeah um were there any kind of previous demo versions of this song that were maybe like very different from the final product like Sigrid writing it she was supposed to like be like with there was supposed to be another scene for that and i have a little cave sounding elvish sounding version of it that i just found yesterday when i was just oh looking yeah through material i remember that yeah it was supposed to be like she's kind of like humming it yeah i remember that and astral projecting herself to the elf cave <laughs> i remember that yeah that's so funny with the there were so many they were like what was it how many versions did, did you count we have i have i have 60 plus in in one folder at least yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of like, because the song was coming together as they were also figuring out like what that scene was going to look like and feel like. And and the story was progressing, you know, they, they as Rachel being Rachel being Rachel found the heart of the character and became the heart of the movie. So then the, as this song started shaping up, they realized they earned the emotional moment of the movie because originally that was going to be a comedic moment at the end where they all like became like, broke out and had an orgasm that was originally the plan like the audience <laughs> would hit this note and then david was like no we gotta we gotta find her voice a little bit more like thematically and and i think as the song developed the film developed and so there was a lot of yeah we need drums at the beginning no wait let's do guitar no wait let's do just because they were as they were trying to figure out and while they were filming um they were trying different theories of what that scene will look like and what that shot will look like and they were kind of shaping each, each other up I yeah they were shaping like, each other and then the piano you know it's so cool i think that that happened yeah the whole thing was so collaborative so it, we really felt like a part of the film you know it wasn't just like you didn't feel like you're just writing songs for the movie you really felt a part of the story um and how it shaped which was which yeah. was which was an exciting thing i think for all mm-hmm. of us crazy crazy cool that's cool um we spoke with David, the director, um, maybe when it first came out, and he revealed, I believe, that Double Trouble was like this close to going to Ariana Grande. Is that right? No. Or like if it. <laughs> <laughs> What's the story behind that? What did I get wrong? Oh, uh, I um, no. I what I told I had because the idea was I was gonna have. Yeah, I think he's just guessing that, but that's not the whole. Fact uh, check. <laughs> yeah. No, no, but I think he's just guessing because I had that chorus in my uh, phone. I was thinking of another artist. And I was going to be like, I always record melodies on my phone. I'm always like, oh, okay, I'm going to go in with this person in a month or wherever. So I'll just save that and present this melody to them in the session. Mm-hmm. And I was saving that for an artist that was not Ariana Grande. Um, but when we needed to find a great chorus for the Eurovision song, I had the, oh, then you love me. It was just like the melody it wasn't exactly that it was like around that and then we shaped it into that um but yeah it was 
Was there ever, I mean, I imagine once you started writing Husevik, you were pretty locked in. Was there ever any thought of like, God, this would be a great pop tune for X artist? Was there ever like a, a backup plan for giving it to someone else? Not with Husevik, because at that point it was very, it was sort of the last uh, like song. And it was the one that was kind of the hardest to crack. But like we talked about, the, the story came so much from the script at that point. So we yeah. were it's writing so it for integrated. Script, basically, yeah. One of my very favorite things in Oscar ceremonies past is watching the nominees for the best original song perform. And this is going to be a wildly different ceremony and i'm curious if y'all have talked or figured out is, is there going to be a performance of husevik at the oscars what is that going to look like w what's the plan there uh they still haven't got a solid plan we were just on a call with them and i think it's a fluid situation they're still figuring out i know that they're, they're definitely and somehow there will be music performances as it looks right now yeah, it's and hard to say somehow, at this point. I don't, I don't, yeah i just don't know if they yeah. know yet when and where you know what i mean but i think they're all working that out i mean that's that's not an easy job those those yeah. folks have, you know? i haven't convinced steven soderbergh yet but i think like when he sees my performance into the iphone he's going to be pretty <laughs> convinced he's, he is making my biopic so i should actually call him and ask him. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah let's patch him into this call right here let's get him on the horn i yeah, mean that's another now, like surreal yeah another surreal you know, moment in life when you're on a Zoom and you realize you're on a Zoom with, with him. And you're like, oh, wait, that's... And you're like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Cher and Jesse Collins, they're pretty intense. Like, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, pretty awesome legends, actually. Yeah, I know. Um, I've, I've got one last question for you, boys. Thanks for taking the time. It's a simple question. Um, how jealous are you of the song "Ya Ya Ding Dong," incredibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't measure that that <laughs> level of jealousy. It's just like they, yeah. It's a who it's won, a you know, in the movie. What like what song <laughs> do you have in your head when you go out of the theater? You know, it's a it's in a bar. It's they've named a bar after it. So in Husavik, in Husavik. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's had, this movie's had that big of an impact over there. Oh, Husavik has been campaigning for us without even, we didn't know about this, but they like, they, they love it so much. The town created a video, like lobbying for, it was crazy. I mean, it's not crazy, it's amazing. They've got a Ya Ya Ding Dong bar, they put a website, they have like a children's choir singing the song. I mean, it's so heartwarming and you realize like this means so much to them. And so we kind of all want to win for Husavik. I mean, yeah, what a Definitely. legacy, wow. Awesome. That's the time I have with y'all. Thank you so much for chatting. This was such a great conversation. Yeah, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, take care and uh, break a leg. Good luck. I'm rooting for you. Thank you. Thanks thank so you much. so much.